are back. You're listening to You Would Think, the Philadelphia Flyers podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Collington, and joining me once again, Kevin Dursow. How are you, buddy? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. We're, you know, getting into those summer show vibes, you know, watching some, some playoff hockey. We're closing in on the draft, free agency. It's, it's about to be a busy couple of weeks, but uh, as of right now, nothing too, too crazy going on in Flyerland. Uh, there was a press conference uh, as of... As of this recording this morning, uh, Wednesday morning, uh, Dan Hilferty and Keith Jones had a press availability. We'll talk about that. We'll get into the the playoff recap, the preview for the Stanley Cup final, you know, all of that. Uh, As we dive into it here today, follow us on social media at YWT Podcast. Follow Kevin at Kevin underscore Derso. Find us everywhere you find your podcast, including sportstalkphilly.com. So we're starting with the Flyers news kind of right off the top. Uh, There's not a whole lot, not even as much rumor and innuendo is last last show here uh pretty simple dan helferty keith jones made themselves available to the media this morning kevin mm-hmm. um tell us about it what what did we get i mean not a ton because they're not the people that i think everybody wants to hear from in terms of roster construction it's not right. their job completely I, actually and i didn't even put this in the article i did on the presser but one of the interesting things that uh keith jones said in regards to danny briere is i'm not his boss we're partners which is interesting. So in other words, that's kind of a look, I'm here to help when Danny says he wants some help and wants me to facilitate something, but it's Danny's show when it comes to building the team. And if you know, Keith Jones, that can't come as much of a surprise. That's sure very much his management style. Yeah. And I, so there were like, there were a couple of like kind of nothing points out of this whole thing. Like as you would expect, not that there was much to speculate on this, but Dan Hilferty opened with a statement and basically backed the entire management group, backed what Keith Jones does, backed what Danny Riera has done, backed John Tortorella. Now we knew that already anyway. Yeah. There's yeah, not, not really much, much there's not really much to talk about with it. You just take, you know, all the stuff that he's had to talk about, whatever. Um, a lot of a lot was made about the timing of this, kind of like, so what's the point of having Dan Hilferty and Keith Jones speak now versus six weeks ago you know oh, let's right. say a week let's say it was a week after the season ended even then it would have still made some sense or at any time in between really you know why now well i, I think because like the the interesting part of that quest like asking that question is to do it in into june now i mean if we go if we go back far enough i believe at around this time last year the stanley cup final was going on and we were hearing from the likes of danny briere because they were making a trade Right. They were actually doing off-season work. There's really no – like, their only off-season work to this point has been the Fedotov contract. That's yeah. about it. You know, there's a lot of talk about some of the other stuff that they're going to do and a lot of the uh, – beyond the rumors of the one player in particular that everybody really wants to know about what's going on. Like, like there's a lot of talk about Travis Konechny, as expected. He's probably the – they basically have said he's probably the priority at this right. point. You know, and- extending him long-term is probably the priority. And that is what it is. So it just seemed like like, there were people who kind of tried to get it into their, like you kind of almost create the narrative that, well, the only reason they could possibly want to have a press conference is because they know something we don't know. And it's going to be an announcement. And it really isn't an announcement. It was just done like end of season media availability. And and just to touch on that, because obviously the the rumor is always Mitch Kov. Keith Jones was very careful with his words, uh, essentially Mm -hmm. saying that they know nothing that if he ends up here great cool he will be welcomed with open arms i believe was the quote mm-hmm. and uh otherwise they don't know anything and it's russia that's how it goes sure. until until he shows up you don't know nothing the bigger part of the quote is actually the first part that i put in the article i did okay. which is it really doesn't affect any like basically anything so in terms of if something were to happen yes you're right that's great they're welcoming with open arms, all that type of stuff. And the fans should be excited if that happens. But they're under the impression it's still three years. This will be year two of three. He's got two years left on that contract. And that's the expectation still. And He's it's not, not going to necessarily change. expected to be here. And and regardless of whether this happens or doesn't, it doesn't really affect the offseason was the point. So I, I and I, you know, I don't think there's any reason not to take their word for things like that. So. If he's telling you whether he plays or doesn't play for the Flyers, it doesn't matter. We're approaching this the same way. 
because, and I'm going to get into that in a second, because he did give a much, before all this ever came up, he gave a detailed answer on kind of what dictates their timeline for now. And it's not a, it's not an exact science, obviously. Um, so, but that really kind of put an end to the Mishkov talk. Hilferty kind of addressed it too. And, and like even said, from a fan perspective, sure, you want it now and you wish it, you hope it happens and all stuff like that. But he's, he pulls back and goes, but playing the business card, I can't just be a fan about it. I've got to understand that he's under contract. We have no control. So we just watch him and yeah. wait until it happens. At some point, just, it's going to be just great. Keep getting, we just keep getting more excited. Right. And at some yeah. point, this is going to be great for the Flyers, but that might not be tomorrow. It might be two years from now. Yep. That's all there is to it. Um, so the, 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 the real meat of like, I think what was really brought up was kind of the idea that of how some of this off season is going to be shaped and then kind of looking to next season, what defines success again? We kind of already talked about that with the first year where it was like, well, success is going to be, doing more than you thought you were going to do or players taking steps that you didn't expect things like that. Like you weren't going to try to measure at the beginning of the year. We even said, we expect the wins and losses to not look so great. So a winning season, a successful season is going to be this guy looked really good. looks like a piece for the future. And so did that guy. And so did that guy. And you got some of those answers. I think like th the player, everybody turns back to easily is Tyson Forrester. It's yep. Hey, look what he did. That looks like a player that we have every reason to be excited. And the goal is take the next step. What's the next step further than that? That's success next season. And sure. you can do that. And you can do that with probably eight, nine, 10 other guys on that are currently on the roster in terms of whether it's the younger guys like Bobby Brink or, you know, somebody of that nature, whether it's somebody that you, you know, somebody like Jamie Drysdale that you just got that you're sitting here going, well, we're only scratching the surface with them. We don't really know much about them yet. Still. What does he turn into? It could be about a guy like Cam York who took a big step and you're saying, what's the next step? And well, it could it could even be about, you know, it can even be about your goalie. It can be about Sam Harrison, who you sure. know can start games and can start down the stretch. But it's is there another level? Sure, That's maybe success. Travis Sanheim kind of showed a bit of another level to start the season, had overall he's a not out of the equation. Season. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. What does this mean for him? You know, did, sure. Does he take another step? Does he? extend his play from the first 20 games of the season can he push that to 40 50 60 games can he put a whole season of that together because exactly. quite frank quite frankly he looks like a norris candidate the first three weeks of the year last year sure and so that's what success kind of looks like and they kind of talked about and this kind of lumps into the answer danny briere gave about how he didn't he doesn't feel like they're consistent playoff contenders yet that it doesn't mean next year they'll be in contention for the playoffs and that's kind of what they were echoing. Like, you know, sure, you want to win games. You want to be in the playoff push. You want to try to get there. But we have to recognize patience here as the big factor. Uh, I thought it was really interesting that Hilford, he brought up, he studied, like, they're, they're studying other franchises. They're looking at Florida and going, because we're, we're going to get to the stand like a final, obviously. Yeah, we are. And they're, they're looking at a team like Florida and going, well, how did they do it? What can we take from their way of doing things that could work for us? And, Fleece Calgary. Well, sure. There's certain, you know, trade, you know, won't, won't trade for a franchise player. Yeah, right. Get a top and, fifth, get a top 10 player in the NHL for well, it, trade a guy who had 110 points for a guy who e pretty much can equal that any well, given year. Exactly. And, right. <sighs> Crazy. You know, without thinking, you know, without thinking twice about it. I know. But, but it, it's about making a thing. And, and, and then Jonesy, like, kind of also, not countered the point because that's not really the right word here, but like was adding in that you don't want to take a step back, but he kind of mentioned like take a step back in terms of even if you take a step back in the number of games you won or the points total or where you finished in the standings, you don't want to take a step back in what the culture's become. That was the primary goal of this season yes. was building some of that culture and you want to keep that continued. Again, another line that I thought was really interesting was talking about how from the hockey side to the business side that maybe even if there was no animosity behind it or anything like that, putting up the, like kind of putting up these walls that were like, hey, you're not welcome on this side. This is the business side and you stick to the hockey side and vice versa. And that they've kind of taken that down and it's like, OK, everybody's part of this equation. Everything's got to work in one way, shape or form to make the whole thing go. And. I thought that was an interesting, again, kind of, 
I'm gonna get the, I'm gonna get to the next part of this, which is more the actual what goes into the roster construction of it that that is about right. the patching things up. But that's the other aspect of patching certain things up is if you built up walls between certain departments and, need, and nobody can talk to each other and there's a lack of communication and probably because of it, a lack of transparency and accountability as a result, then, you know, then what, what does that say about, you know, certainly what does it say about the rest of your franchise? We're sitting here looking at stuff on the surface and going, Oh, this contract may be a problem and, and, that, and this and that. And it's no inside of your own building. You've got basically what you're saying is you got people who aren't talking to each other. And that's what you had to fix. So if that part is right. fixed in year one, that's all that that can only make things better as you go forward. So I, I was encouraged to hear something like that where it's like, okay, and that's really pulling the curtain back on how bad it was. Oh yeah. Right? Like like to sit there and say and, we, and we, we kind of knew how bad. Talk. Yeah. Well, and and even just like in the locker room, for instance, like we we knew there were some issues. Um I don't think we knew, you know, quite to that extent, quite getting that curtain pulled back like that. But mm -hmm. it's it's nice to see the transparency. It's nice to see, hey, we're going to be communicative about what our issues are and how we're going to fix them. Right. So. Exactly. And so which kind of segues into the other part of the mess. Like if, if your job, if your job in year one, if you're Keith Jones and Danny Briere and, and Dan Hilferty stepping in for that matter, and yeah. and one part of your job is. We got to clean up the mess that's internally within this organization. We've got to clean up the part that is what's going on behind the scenes that people may not know about that we can still fix yeah. without it being such a pro like a public problem. That's number one. Number two being what happened to parts of the fan base? Like what did you know? What did we do exactly to screw this thing up? Let's talk to people. Let's actually get some direct feedback to find out where did we go wrong with this thing? Where did this go wrong? And how can we try to fix that? And Hilferty immediately pointed out, you know, in a few weeks, about a month, I think is what it really is. They're going to have development camp right after the draft. And he mentioned the stands here will be full and we're going to do what we always do, which is go around and talk to people and just, you know, tell them to stick with us and find out what they what's working for them, too. And you can't you go wrong. With, yeah, you can't go yeah. wrong with getting direct feedback, which then takes you to the other part of the mess, which is the cap space and everything that kind of goes into actually putting a roster together. And they don't have a lot of space. Let's just be blunt about that. They don't no, have a lot of space. No. And a yet. lot of it has to do well. And a lot of it has to, well, not yet. And a lot of it has to do with two things. One is that you have to factor in any long-term IR eligible players at the beginning of the season for e even for just a day. Sure, sure, sure. So, Right away, that throws Ryan Ellis and Ryan Johansson into the mix as that's a lot of money. That's, that's ten point. That's ten point two five million dollars that you have to account for even for just one day. Now, do you you do have workarounds because you're going to probably run a bunch of players that are of the in between rankings right now, the minor league NHL players, so to speak. Right. Right. You know, and and on one like in one case. You're going to do it with Tyson Forrester because Tyson Forrester's waiver exempt. So you're going to bump him just to clear the cap for a second and then say, come on back. You're going to probably do it. You would probably do it with the likes of along along the lines of Brink, Adderd, you know, Jenning probably falls into that category when the time yep. comes. You know, you know, you're going to put Peterson, Cal Peterson through waivers and yep. just have that slip to the minors and just be buried in the minors. And bury the one point. Three five or whatever it is, right? Right. So you're still going to be on the books for three eight five, is what it is. Yep. Uh, you're still paying, going from one year to the next. You're still paying retention on Kevin Hayes, which is in the three million range. Yeah, it's like three and a half, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's pretty close. Yes. Uh, and then I have it up here. It is the contract was seven point one four, so it should be like three point six two. Three five seven. Okay, something like yeah. that. Yeah. And Tony D'Angelo's buyout money, which has one more year, is one point six seven mil. I believe. One and two thirds. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. that's a lot. Like, and the good yeah. news is, the good news is, D'Angelo is one more year of the buyout, and then yep. it's over. And Hayes Peter is two. Peterson is one year. Johansson is one year yep. as much as you're going to have to deal with Ryan Ellis for three more seasons. And you're going to have to deal with Kevin Hayes for two. And you're going to have to deal with a couple of other things that go on for a little while. Like the, 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 no Chuck Fletcher wasn't very good at his job. No kidding. Um, and, and for what it's like, for what it's, for what it's worth, I think you're going to be dealing with, 
just to give yourself any space at all, you have no space to sign anybody. Remember no. this. Like, nope. like, like right now, if we just went through some of the very basics, Bobby Brink does not have a contract, whether you can bury it in the minors or not. You know what I mean? Like for the day, I mean. Well, and it, that also means if you're making a trade, it's pretty money in, money out. Well, it would have to be number yep. one. And then, but you also, you also need contracts for Igor Zamula is going to probably get a new contract. He's an RFA. Yep. And then there's not really a UFA that you're going to look to probably keep, you know, your only UFAs right. that you would have to spend on are Gurianov, who they said is not coming back. Mark Stahl, who they said is probably not coming back. And then Eric Johnson's kind of lingered as an option. But again, if you don't really have space, you're going to probably just go with the cheaper route. I mean, oh. I think, I think Jennings do for a contract too, as an RFA. So and that comes into play too. By the way, we didn't mention him when we were talking about LTIR guys and dead money, but Cam Atkinson also only has one more year left. I'm just saying. Well, that's where I was going with this. Cause I think to give yourself some flexibility immediately, I think that that's where the buyout option comes in. And then yes, he's on your books for technically two more years, but it's, it's still going to give you some form of savings. And then at that point you go in next year with, one more year of Hayes retention, um, Atkinson buyout, which would be one more year at that point, and then and Ellis's uh, LTIR money. So here's my thing: if if you're going to discuss buying out Cam Atkinson, I, I think mm -hmm. it's a reason. I think it's a reasonable discussion. I think it's it's a discussion that can be had. But you, I would really like to know. If you're going to have Matt Bamichkov on your team next year, because the truth of it is, is if he's not going to be here this year, but you get a pretty good chance that he's going to be here next year, kind of think you just take your medicine, you eat the one bad year of his contract rather than spread it over two, and you try to maximize for next year and for the, you know, start moving forward. Maybe you make a big free right. agent next year. The only reason that you can't potentially is that then you're completely reliant on moving a contract in some way because it's the only way you can sign everybody else. The, the RFAs I'm talking about. Like, yeah, but I, I think that's more doable than, you know. I mean, sh short of actually like legitimately sending through a roster of 20 people then on the first night of the season or day, day one of the season and sending everybody else to the miners to try it. Even <laughs> then I don't, even then I don't know if it's enough because it's okay. that's fair. like, that, that's the hard part. I'm with, like, I'm with you. If there's a way to not put the extra year onto that, I would do it. I just don't know if I see a way to do it. I was playing around with cap friendly when this was kind of like a thing or whatever, or just even without Mishkov and. How it, many, reten it, how many retention spots do they have used for this upcoming year? Well, trade retention is different. Okay. Like, it, it, like, I, like it, salary retention? Yes. Like, okay. Like, via, yeah. Well, no, no salary, I know. Do you know how many they have this year? I think yeah, they, one. they have a, they have one available or they're, no, they have two one. available. They have one okay. used. Okay. So. Okay. So you, can you send half of Cam Atkinson's contract somewhere? I mean, you could try. I, I the problem is, is I don't, I don't know what team's taking them based on what you saw last year. Like, even at half of that cap hit, like, like a Utah wouldn't, be willing to take a risk if you give know. them a fourth give them a third round pick you know, I, don't, I don't think it's something you want to do but i, I think well, at it, that well, point it, give them the whole contract but you know what i mean but exactly like it's you're then you're creeping into territories that i don't think you want to go down because the, the look the whole the whole point of this whole thing was about how jonesy basically said listen when the time whenever the time comes like the indicator for the timeline is when you have the money, when when the, some of the cap space opens up, there's stuff that's going to come off the cap. Um, and if you're looking further down the line, we're going to have, like he's saying, we're going to have real key decisions to make and we have to get them right. There's no room for error when it comes to adding players to the mix and using up that money again. Like right. if you're going to back yourself into the cap corner, you better do it with guys that you actually realize you want to have and that's why again it goes back to the mess created by previous regimes when you sit there and you go did you need to keep bristol line in for however many extra years it was four, five technically so it's yeah. three more you know did you need to do that then did you need to before the last year of chuck fletcher did you need to sign travis sanheim to that extension right then and there or could you have waited that out that was up for discussion you know like you yep. had options where you didn't get buried by certain contracts right away 
And and I'm not saying like like Sandheim's kind of the hard one because Sandheim now now I think you look and move forward and you go well there is a place for him. You were yeah, gonna have to sign yeah. that contract in some way, shape, or form. He has recovered that. The difference is, and listen, maybe you can find somebody for Ristolainen because people just want to go off of the aura that is, you know, instead of worrying about whether or not you know based not track record, but no, he, was, he was solid this year. When he played, when, yeah, when he played, he was like, solid. Like, believe it or not, that's a, that's the hard part for me to come back around from is that he didn't play for most of the second half of the season. So, you know, what? Not even say what are you going off of because it doesn't even have anything about. Go, it's not even about going off of what what he is or what he was during the season or whatever. It's just he, he didn't even come back to give you a chance to prove like I am healthy, I can play at that level still. Right. Like that that the injury is not going to be the end, like the end of this thing or whatever. Right. So that's where they're, but that's where they're coming from. And, and in the immediate, and that doesn't even include other expiring contracts, by the way, they right. like well, you have one more year on because you're going to get to the end of the season next year and be looking at, I believe, let's see who who's up. Hathaway's up. Deloria, you'll have one year left. Yep. Like, and Deloria, you would probably still see your way through that at 1.75 million. Why? Wouldn't? I agree. But I you agree. know what I'm saying? Or you try to move it because maybe somebody's crazy enough to take 1.75 mil at that point. Sure. Honestly, Nick Deloria is a great and he's a really, really solid fourth liner in today's NHL. And one of these years when they're willing to move him, somebody will scoop him up at the trade deadline that's going for a run. Maybe he's a great depth piece. He's a good locker room guy. He's a big vibes guy. I I think Nick Delorier would be a great trade deadline pickup for a team that's trying to trying to fill out a roster. It's possible. I it, it, there's too much to get it, and that's the point though. Is that again? It, it's right. it's a word. It's a word people don't have time for, which is patience. Right. You know. It's well it, when you're waiting on a guy who is in Russia and may not come over for a couple of years we can afford to be patient. Like I, I I think, and we've talked about this on the show a lot, but like, I think the hammer comes down and the, you, you hit the gas pedal once he steps, once Mitch Kov steps foot in North America. Well, and there, but, in, but until then, well, sure. And therein right. lies, and therein lies the problem. Yep. The temptation of it being possible now. I agree. Changes the way people think. Because now, now all of a sudden, like I, I get this, I can get the sense and I haven't seen, oh, I'm bloodthirsty too. I, I, I don't actually want them to, but well, I want to hear Mitch Marner proposal. Well, it, well and, and in, in, and in fairness, I didn't really see negative feedback to what was being said about the possibility that this is not, you know, that this is still a work in progress and there's, they, they got to wait to right. clean up the mess kind of before they can move forward. I think people appreciated that that it was called as it like calling it as you see it. It's still sure. a mess because that's something that you didn't get with with the previous people or whatever. So you can go back to hating the previous moves all you want to. Oh, and, and we do. But you know what? Like, and and this is actually a good segue into where we're gonna go with the other stuff around the league because one of the things I've seen a lot of is about because there's a player on one of the there's a player on one of these two teams that is now in the Stanley Cup final. You'll probably be, you can figure it out quickly, and I'm sure the listeners may be able to figure it out quick quickly too. Okay, because I'm watching a lot of examples on social media of people crying over spilt milk that has been known for long enough. Like in terms of, you can't go back and change what's happened from somebody else's decision, no matter whose it was. Right. That's what Keith Jones and Dan Hilferty were feeding you today with this was sure we can't change the past and the mess that we're in. All we can do is make the right decisions to get out of it. Absolutely. So bear with us while we make the right decisions to get out of it. We know it's important. We know we've got to get it right. And again, not something I included in the article per se, because it was a lot of businessy businessy speak, if you will. But right. they did say that like 92 to 95 percent of the people who had season tickets last year renewed. Or something awesome. like that, and but, but why? Well, and, why well, why did that they, happen? Because, because they've, they've been they've saying this them. for a year, right? Because they've been saying basically the same thing since they came in, and it's fans have been begging for since uh, essentially the last days of Ron Hextall. Like honesty is refreshing, yeah, right. And it's, I honestly think this is kind of what Hextall was doing, 
But the difference is Briere and Jones will talk to you about it. And yeah. we all know that Ron Hextall wanted his own little private club. And, you know, he's the only one who has the manifesto and knows what's going on. And in this case, we see a little bit of a different managerial style and we see several, several collaborators. And, you know, like you mentioned, Danny or Keith Jones talking about how the fact that him and Danny Breer are partners, right? He's not his boss. And right. that sort of thing is nice to see, but also it's, it's nice to see a commitment to winning, even if that means losing. <laughs> Some okay, but there's also a difference between like again, this doesn't go against the counter argument of you don't tank, you know, because people sure, immediately sure, sure, associate sure. it with like, oh, well, then just tank then. No, no, no. If you just don't have as good a team and you naturally lose, there's nothing you can do about that. You know what well, I mean? You're going through it. Like, like there's a legitimate chance that for the upcoming season that they bring back pretty much everybody exactly the same as it was. Pretty close to the they, same roster. Unless yeah. they make a trade. And even then, how many hockey trades are you making in one offseason that, that, that don't include the things you don't want to move? You know, like you might be stuck. And if that's the case, then you're getting another year of, you know, Morgan Frost is kind of up and down the lineup where you're getting another year of Ryan Paling might be playing like a second line center, even though he's not really a second line center or who's the, like, let's try to do some of the other ones I'm thinking of. Cause like it was bumping guys up like, in the places you don't I, expect. Can I ask you a bit of a tough question here? Yeah. Well, first one's not tough. We're going to get to some tough questions. <laughs> I'll lead you in with some easy ones here. Okay. What, what side does Travis connect primarily play on? Right. What side does Matt Vamichkov primarily play on? Left. Okay. Who's their he center did, long term? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> is it Morgan Frost? Uh, no, it's somebody that they don't have yet. I was going to say, is it Sean That's Couturier? Because if the answer it, to those two I don't think it's no, Couturier. then you have a problem. Well, we, we've talked about that. We already know right. that. Like, they don't have a number one center like it. And that's the thing, right? Like, I think what people are losing a little bit out of this is that you would be setting yourself up for like with the connecting conversation is you're trying to potentially set yourself up with maybe. And here's the thing, maybe tomorrow and this upcoming season, for example, and, and let's just for hypothetical sake, say Mishkov plays this year. Let's just yeah. for hypothetical sake, say he's here. So Mishkov gets a chance pretty much almost right at the top right away. Because he's, be he's top supposed six, to be that good. One. Yep. Well, well, top six for sure. I, like, I'm teetering towards, like, let's put it this way. Who would be your top line? Probably him. Probably. If if not in the beginning, then, like, at some point, probably, right? Pretty pretty quickly, yeah. So he's one of them. I would feel safe saying that, at least in the immediate, Travis Konechny would be your one on the other side. Probably right. You know, look, long term, maybe you're two. But... Right I now, I, I think ideally Travis Konechny is probably your two. I, well, ideally, but right now on the team is currently constructed, he's going to be your one. Yeah, there's no way and, around that. And for the record, if he if he were to ever slide to two, he's a really good two. Right now, and and in fairness, by the way, so I I remember I had I had this conversation fairly recently. Yeah. If Mishkov's included, you also have on, and this is just generalizing the winger, not going left and right specific here because we know they bounce around like crazy sometimes but yep. these your wingers that include mishkov obviously would be one of them and then you go connect me if you assuming you do the extension so connect me tip it faraby forrester you all of a sudden have like the hey, here's the log jam right like look at all these wingers here's and the core I, I didn't even bring in i didn't even bring up bobby brink yep. as one of them also he probably slots in as a three as well right Probably. And then like my point in saying that is that that makes it feel like something's got to give. Oh, if Mishkov's here and I've got four other guys that are all or not all, but almost all, I think connect needs the one exception at this point. The rest are all in that 25 ish and under category. Travis, Travis connect is the old man. Well, he is. But my point is, is that the everybody else, falls, that group. if everybody else falls into a similar category, Something's got to give, right? Yep. I got I got six guys who fall into this, or five guys technically who fall into well, the same category, and I don't have centermen. Well, what am you I going to do? And you would assume at some point that 
I mean, they're probably not going to spend too many draft picks on wings for the next couple of years, but you'll pick up a couple and somebody's going to try to crack the lineup somewhere along the way. Well, so sure. Theoretically, you got too many wingers, man. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but, but that leads. Well, and that's and that's where the hockey trades start to come in. Well, that's what lead. But yeah. that's what leads to. Oh, well, so maybe we have a conversation about Joel Farabee. Maybe. Yeah. I'm saying like, it, 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 let's just wait until there's a. a I know if, if if you're Danny Briere right now and you have to trade one of Travis Connecting or Joel Farabee, who's gone? Probably Farabee because Connectney, okay. I know what I, I feel like more than I know with Farabee, I know what I'm getting with Connectney every okay. time. I know every game I'm getting somebody who's engaged and trying to make a difference. And I know that for a season, I'm getting roughly a 30 goal score. I think Farabee's getting there. And I think it took Travis Connectney a while to get there too. Um, well, I, look, I'm not. I wouldn't try to do it this year if you can find a way to make all this work. That's what I'm saying. Oh, I know. Like, I, wouldn't, I was just curious don't because the, I don't force the hockey trade, right? Because I, I do think, and don't force it with a guy who's under 25, right? Well, I was gonna say I do think there is definitely still some untapped potential with Faraby. I don't think we've seen his ceiling. We've seen some flashes of it, but I and I, honestly, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know I've been high on Joel Faraby for a very well, like, long re, time. Re, real but, talk, real talk for a minute here. Yeah, you, re, you really want to get cap space immediately if if this is the way that it's going, and you want to do it in a way that you know the contract is gone, kind of material. Then you trade Scott Lawton. If that's what you really want, if you want to find the easiest way to get cap space, knowing that the contract could go in full, like I don't feel like you know for certain, like. I don't say you, I don't want to say you don't feel like you know for certain, but if you're hesitant about Joel Farabee because he's in an age bracket that you don't want to move from, I still don't think anybody would have a problem trading for him in full. The contract seems <sighs> relatively affordable. He's at his at the age that he is. You go to the right team. I think somebody wants to try that. The problem is, what are you getting back, and is it worth it to trade a, a guy who's that young? In God, you know, you know what sucks. What. Joel Farabee is going to make a great Boston Bruin. Uh-huh. Holy. Oh, my God. He's going to murder people. Oh, it's going to be crazy. Okay. But, my, but like, but that's, my, but that's my point. That's why I go back to the Lawton thing. Yeah. It's like, if all this is about is how do I get some money, then there's a guy who you trade because he's 30, right? Or he's getting close to 30. How much longer can you factor that into your future, even if you want good leaders in the room? You sometimes have to make the tough decision. If it's only about the money. If it's not only about the money and it's about the culture and everything else, then you don't touch you don't move Scott Lawton, at least not right now. No, then you know you don't then then you don't move anybody, is my point. Well. Then okay. then then you relatively punt the off season and be like, listen, there's nothing we can do with the money. We've got to let the D'Angelo buyout get off the books. We got to get towards a point where the Hayes money is almost off the books. We got to get this Peterson contract out of here, Johansson out of here, and then maybe we can start to talk about who we can bring in after the fact. Well, and for what it's worth, that's essentially what Keith Jones and Dan Hilferty said they're going to do. Right, and but that's my point. So, so. you either, you either trade somebody you probably don't want to trade, or yep. you. I have agree. to punt the off season for, no, the most, I, for the most part. I agree. And like, if, if I'm playing an HL 24 on the PlayStation five, I'm absolutely fine that a trade. Cause it's way more fun that way. Cause we're playing <laughs> video games, but, but it's in, not a video in, game. In, right. In the real world, in real life with cap consequences and long-term futures to think about. Exactly. Let's, let's pump the brakes a little bit here. We don't well, need to the, trade Travis connecting beside the point anyway, because of the fact that like it, That's why, and that's why I go back to the Atkinson thing because the Atkinson decision is the easiest way to get money without touching a player that you feel like you know you want to keep. But I think you do whatever you can to not buy out Atkinson just to get it over and done with. And again, the only reason I keep coming back to that is because they're going to need money from somewhere. And if you don't want to move Faraby per se, and you don't want to move Lawton, who I think outside of Konechny, who they've already indicated is a priority, so I I doubt it's going to be him. And if if I if I have that kind of doubt right now that oh it's it, their priority is to keep him, you know for beyond well beyond next year that it's looking like a long term deal right like that's the goal right then it's not going to be him, and 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 I can't sit there and go well for one year he's at making five point five million dollars that's very tradable for what he's given, if somebody really wants to make an upgrade but they they're clearly not going to go that way so right. I can't find many other options that I sit there and I go well I'm not intrigued by that player. Or they aren't, for that matter. 
you know? Well, right. Well, I'm just sitting here and I'm trying to think if maybe you can get cheeky and sneak somebody through waivers on that day to be cap compliant. Like, for Might example, well, I'm saying somebody you don't necessarily want to throw on there. Like, it, I mean, like you throw Cam Atkinson. We throw Cam Atkinson on waivers. You could you throw. I mean, yeah, sure. And, and maybe even Aristo. Sure. And like it. See, I think Risto's a little more. You're a little more likely to lose Risto because he's still a functional NHL player. The only reason Um, I disagree with that is because one way or the other, whether it's whether you did it with Atkinson or you did it with Risto, it's north of five million dollars a year. And I want you to find me the team that's got that on the day the season starts. Well, I because if you do, because if you do it, you're not claiming him and then saying, oh, by the way, he can go to the minors now. No, you're claiming him for you. Right. And that's, that's, that's why it works. So I wonder, I wonder if that's how you get your money through. And I wonder if they're planning on doing something like that. By the way, the only reason I'm not sure about that also is because like the Peterson contract, I don't think it just wipes it all away. It's percent. It just chunks out the the money or the, like, like you, the like my money. Point, Right. And my point is, is that like, that's why my point with Atkinson is, is that you can literally take that contract and cut it more, almost more. I think it's more than in half. You'd be paying like two right. point million. You'd that's save three million. And that might be enough money to start with to say, if I, if I sent down every player that I've got, who I can think of, who would go to the minors and probably pass through because they may not be great NHLers yet. I send all of them down and I include, um, I include Forrester, who's waiver exempt. Right. And by the time right, that I, one's I, safe. <laughs> right. And by the time I do all of that, I have a, I have just enough money to be cap compliant and move those other two contracts to LTIR to bring up everybody else effective immediately. And then you're ready uh, to go. Right. Like, but but that's it. So it, it, it's interesting though, because it almost comes across like like think about it from an off-season planning standpoint, you're going. I can imagine people is so that's really the only move is buying out Cam Atkinson and the rest of the right. Right, and then the rest of the offseason looks like this. You know, we just sit there and kind of like, what do we do? What do we do? It, and the yeah, draft, man. the draft is important. And listen, maybe there is something crazy. Like, like we talked about the um the possibility of you know what's going on with Martin Nakash and you know, like being players like that being available and what could you put together to make it happen or something like that. You know what I mean? Like if those things were possible. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But like right. at some point at some point, that might be a pipe dream dream this offseason because you just don't have stuff you're gonna move a ton of. Right. And and here's the thing. It's better to make no moves than bad moves. I think it's I I would rather you do nothing. I would than, rather focus on the long term than do then something say, super short term. Say, for example, trade uh, a good de- young defenseman and multiple draft picks so that you can trade for another draft defenseman the following day. Like you wouldn't want to do any crazy stuff like that. That well, would be wild. And like Farabee's a perfect example in this because Farabee comes like at his age, you're sitting there going, listen, if your if your response is we have no room for error, we've got to get this right. That includes that move. It includes how do we get some cap? Like, yeah, well, when we get cap space, we need to use it wisely and use it right and do all the right, right things. But if you're going to do something to create some more also, you better get that move right too. And I like, agree. Like, we better not be sitting there five years from now well, going when, when his contract is over and he's turning roughly 30, 29, 30 in right. that range. We better not be sitting there at that point going, look at what an all-star career he's had while whomever you get in return or whatever you signed is on the verge of another buyout or something. You can't. Right. Well, have- and, and especially when the team isn't particularly close, right? Like, right, right. Like, if, right. If, right. If you're a, if you're a perennial playoff team and you're going to be good anyway, but this is the move, you know, you're taking a bit of a shot to try to put you over the top. That's one thing we are on foundational building block type stuff with this team. Still, yeah, still. Like we, yeah. they still need a first line center. They still need a, a, a top defenseman. Really? they, might have solved their goaltending issues question mark we'll see i guess but like that's what i'm saying is like Mm -hmm. there's still a lot of work for this team to do this is not the time for you to be trying to squeak out little edge wait out the year it's i believe you said something like nine million dollars off the books for next year the cap's gonna go up a little bit anyway well right so it's what i added up was the that's plenty of money for leon dry's idol 
Well, I wouldn't go that far, but <laughs> they do like you're right though. Four million for Johansson, three point assuming he's in the minors all year, it'd be three point eight five for Peterson. I know right. it's five typically, but uh, right. we know where that we know where that contract's going. It's gonna be three eight five toward the cap. Yeah. And then it's an, uh, what would we say another one point six seven million for D'Angelo, and that's all well, gone. But then the but then the one three five that gets held at the NHL that gets that gets held at the NHL level that just gets wiped out anyway, right? So Pat Peterson's whole five will come off. Uh, yeah, but what I'm saying is is that when you look at the picture at the end of the night, like at the end of the day, when you're getting to the opening night roster and trying to figure out how they get cap compliant this year, you're factoring in three eight five towards. Yeah, that's it fair. You're right, right. Because of the fact that you know you're going to bury the contract, so it's so your relief is not five million. You're already relieving yourself of part of that. It's the it's the three point it's the 3.85 that you get back at the end ultimately. right but that's why i'm saying those two alone are nearly eight million dollars and then i got another 1.67 you know for for when d'angelo is off the books and then another year after that you're looking at the again that the near the other ones right the near three six that is kevin hayes and to be honest screw it who cares if you need to spend you know spend two million this year and one million next year or whatever it's going to be on cam atkinson just right. do it like get it over with take that you know, kind of you know, kind of eat it like you have to it's part of the process right and when and when he's off the books too he's off the books it, you wouldn't be asking that question if you didn't sit him for as long as you did at the end of the year like right. that's the way it is like it, you know what i mean like it just is what it is so all right i think that is a good place to kind of put it uh, a pin in the end of the press conferencey stuff um yep. There wasn't a whole whole lot there, and we still managed to talk about it for forty minutes. So, <laughs> well, it's a, it was a little less than that. Time. No, I know, but still, was, we got time out of it. So, all right. So, where all right. do we want to start? We want to start and, in the uh, east or the west? Um, I think we should start in the east. I think that's a little closer to home for us. I, I am think. in agreement. Yeah. So, for the second year in a row, the Florida Panthers win the East. Uh, they come out. They defeat the New York Rangers in six games. I. I will be honest. I, I underestimated. I will continue to root against the Panthers or uh, bet against the Panthers, and they will continue to prove me wrong. <laughs> yeah, you picked the Rangers. Holy, I sure did. <laughs> uh, here's so, the thing. Here's the thing. Sergey Bobrovsky, man. Yeah. Holy, they have him. The, there's that uh, dialed. By the way, so thanks for taking like five seconds to complete the segue from the last part of this. Where that there's the guy I was talking about. Yep. Like, like. I I really can't like I'm I'm not sitting here saying that that's not a like a decision that haunts. Don't get me wrong. I, of course, but it's a right. decision that was also made eleven years ago. It, right. Exactly. I'm not sitting here like looking at that going. Well, gee, you know, gee, you know, because what was the knock after? Like right away when they when when he went to Columbus. Right away, he's a Vesna winning goalie. But the knock was always well. Then the playoffs come and he disappears you know and then the clock strikes midnight he turns back into a pumpkin and and he can't stop a beach ball you well, know like it turns out that they finally convinced him hey bob you don't have to play 68 games a year well that does help we can give the other guys a shot keep you a little more well rested and you can look like a vezina winning goalie in the playoffs crazy how that works it is Look, the one thing about him that I still can't believe is he's he's 35. He's going to turn 36 in September. And I thought and he, he sure, looks like he's in the best shape of his life. And that but that's the thing. Uh, he was so overly athletic. that I remember even saying during like on this show, no less that eventually like he's going to hit that age and not be able to play because he's thrown his body around like the style he plays just isn't going to be equipped for a 35 year old when it comes well, down to it. And I, to be honest, I think he's changed his style a little bit. Like he's still flexible to make some of those big saves, but I don't think he's throwing himself around like he used to. I think he's not wasting movement. I, I absolutely agree. And I know that he's one of those guys that because he is so athletic because, well, I know because for a long time he was so uh, reckless with his body almost uh -huh. that he sweat out so much here i think he was one of those guys who loses 10 to 15 pounds a game <laughs> and yeah. i think a major 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 factor for this series is that extra rehydration day for sergey bobrovsky 
Yeah, I mean, look, I'm going to save my... I think it's a huge look, deal. I'm going to save my thoughts on the schedule for when we get to the All final right. itself, because I do have thoughts, but we're right... Because right now we're talking about the Florida Panthers and winning the Eastern Conference yep. Finals. I want to stick to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so this was the interesting part. So for me, because I picked Flo- I picked Florida in seven, technically, which, yep. which, which according to you was never going to be the way that it went, because... And I look, we, we will never know. We will never know if... That goes seven. If going back to the garden for game seven changes the narrative, any it could have. Um, honestly, that's where you give the Panthers credit for finishing it on home ice, where you like, hey, you know, you've got been a North really Bay good. Game. They have been good. So everything about game one was what I expected. And then the Rangers win games two and three, but don't really look like the better team in either Even game. If the Panthers had been the better team and the better yeah. team, better team in performance, the better team on Igor paper. Shesterkin, the story coming out of game three was Igor Shesterkin has stolen the Rangers the lead in this series. Well, so, and as much as that's true. So after the, after they won game, after the Rangers won game three, they scored five goals in the final three games of the series. That was it. And uh, listen, uh, there's two things about this. Uh, as much as the goaltending has been great, as much as we can sit here and praise Bobrovsky to no end, it's twofold. The Rangers offense completely disappeared. Everybody who you think would jump in and score, you know, where did Chris Kreider go? Where did Mika Zibanejad go? Kind of where did Artemi Panarin go? And but it goes hand in hand because defensively that team was so on point. And the, and the biggest stat of the, of the entire postseason to this point is that Alexander Barkov, Barkov. Been on the ice has, has allowed no goals to Nikita Kucherov, one to David Pasternak and none to Artemi Panarin in well, a combined, in a combined like hour and a half of ice time. Like it's insane. something stupid. Yep. It's, it's like an so, hour and 24 minutes or some ridiculous nonsense. Like I know, and maybe we, maybe we'll just do this part now because this doesn't really reflect on the whole series or whatever. Sure, like, sure. cause we, whenever somebody makes it, we, we jump in immediately with, well, who are the con Smythe candidates? Alexander Barkov. I think Sergei Barkov's Bobrovsky. leading. I think if Barkov's the leader right now. If it's not Sergei Bobrovsky, man. Oh, I know. But I, that's why I'm saying, I, I, think that Barkov may have a slight edge only well and I'll tell you what I'll, I'll give you another reason why does he have any big goals in this run uh I don't know I don't know about defining big well hold on I I, I got all, all it takes is one and I I give it to him but man Bob has been so incredibly stupid good okay so I know what I'm thinking I know one of the things I'm thinking of already which is Barkov helped set up the game winner uh, in overtime for the Panthers in game and four. And that is that's pretty close. Uh, I'm check I'm checking. I'm checking. So okay. I know that I know he didn't score in the last two games. Okay. Uh, yeah, but almost series. nobody did. So no, I know what I'm saying. <laughs> it, it wasn't the obvious right. It wasn't the obvious guys. Um I'm not really seeing anything with the Boston series. Like I'm, like, I'm also trying to go by defining moments in yeah, terms of yeah, like, yeah. you know, you're going to remember the the guy who won Game Six more than you are Game Three. But regard, know? but regardless, you get what I'm saying is if 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 there's a moment or two for Barkov, I think there's definitely a world where he gets there. But I I think Bobrovsky's got a really strong. So game. so this was this was this is the reason why another reason why I wanted to give Barkov a nod here, kind of because the defensive stat may definitely get some leverage here. Um, once now when I hit total points for the postseason, once I get past the other team, we're going to talk to <laughs> because I have to go through a few names before I can get down the list yeah. to, to other players playing in the series. Uh, Barkov has 17 points in the playoffs and that's Good. only and that's only that's tied with Carter Verhage for second on the team two okay. behind Matthew Kachuk and Matthew Kachuk's been great but, well but and, Matthew, and Matthew, Matthew Kachuk Matthew, also has some cons might value too here he does but here's the thing I don't feel like Matthew Kachuk and I don't know if it's because you know the number is five goals so he's putting up a lot of points without scoring goals like Last year, now last season, Bobrovsky's probably it if they win the cup over Vegas because he was that good, and I'm not taking anything away from that. But Kachuk had something like, beyond just scoring goals, he had something like five game winners. Yeah, I I think some of that. Like those clutch moments may have helped him get a nod for it because it's like every time you needed a goal, it was like he was the guy who was scoring every time. Matthew Kachuk, in my opinion, should have received serious 
conversation for the cons mic last year, even though they lost. He yeah, the that, problem, he was that stupid guy. The problem was how dominant Vegas I know. was in the final, I and then totally, they could just lump it in there. Right. But, but like, but, but I so think on, Matthew, top, so on top of, I'm saying on top of the point total, yeah. though, Barkov has six goals in the playoffs. It doesn't feel like it, but no. he does. And I think when you combine that with the defensive number, and and particularly the stat of taking away a bunch yeah. of guys who had so many points in the regular, well, season. and now he gets the final boss, right? Like now he gets. Well, bingo! If he if, the, right. he if he does anything to tame the two got two of well, it's beyond two. It's three or four guys, really. I mean, it's 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 two. It's there the are main two guys, and the two supporting. There are, there are talented guys on the Edmonton Oilers, but when you're talking about Nikita Kucherov and when you're talking about like the other elite players that he has shut down through this run, Artemi Panarin that he has shut down through this run so far, there's two. Fair enough. It's Connor. It's Leon. And then there are a lot of very good players. That'll be for the rest of the team. Sure. Because Alexander Markov will be glued to 97. And if he's not glued to 97, he's glued to 29. Yep. Okay. That's pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what he is doing with his four to seven right games. Yeah. You you would think you would know that number for how many you times you've brought up wanting him to sign. Listen, I'm just saying it's gonna be great. I mean, just like you can't wait to get your 39 jerseys, you know, whenever the whenever the kid comes over. 29, 39, come on. Well, but anyway. Come uh, on. But anyway, so, like, <laughs> you, you, I do want to go back to your point about Shesterkin really quick because, yeah, yeah, like, the, the, the series nearly went seven because of him. He, he was silly. He was outstanding. Silly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, full like, marks to what they were able to, like – like that was that was a, I mean it was a good competitive series you can't take that away from it it was just one of these you know we're gonna get into the other we'll obviously get into the west's side right. of this too very similar series yeah like like just the trajectory of the way things went you know you look at this one what we have besides the outside of game one you had five straight one goal games three in overtime right crazy you know, um, at, at, at least this time, you know, the, the Rangers at least won two games so that this way, if Peter Laviolette says it, w- it, w- it didn't really feel like a sweep or whatever, you know, <laughs> you know, you can't you can't sit there and kind of go like, oh, it was close. Like it was a close series. No, no it was a very yeah. close. This was this was legit. Very close. It was very close. But at the same time, uh, the Florida just I, I told you that's game, a team, that, that that's a team on a mission. Game four, game five, game six all felt you felt the vice tightening progressively from game to game. Like the first five couple games, especially that's what I'm saying. Like four, you started to see the tide turn five is when they really locked it in. And then six, the Rangers couldn't do anything. The Rangers couldn't do anything. And yeah, at that, at that point, like, I, I mean, you're just going to pummel Igor Shesterkin until something goes in. Like I have, that's it's that simple well that was it it also comes down to especially when you're playing out the kind of playing out the first period and and throughout the course of that that was a relatively close shot total in the first period 13 to 9 all things considered but because it was scoreless like florida got that first one and and it was like at that given point in time it was that's it we're making sure that this is gonna hold up and once and once they got the Second one in the third period. I mean, seriously, the second one in third period, it was game over. Oh, absolutely. It really and felt even, like it. I mean, I even, know there's 10 minutes left. Even when the Rangers score. Right. Even when the right. Rangers I, score. I know there's 10 minutes left. To go. Yeah. There's no shot they're getting more good chances on that. Like, there's, we're done here. I mean, the, the, the Rangers had six shots on goal in the third period of a, of a game that's of an elimination game that they're trailing in. And it has nothing to do with want to. It's literally. Where are you supposed to go when there's no ice? Speaking of not shooting the puck, uh, let's transition over to our other series because, oh boy, the Edmonton Oilers made a habit out of that one in this series. Um, okay. So, like you said, or like you said, these do feel like pretty similar series. Um, we come out of game three with, in this case, Dallas up two to one. Um, mm-hmm. Things have been. I'm not going to say wide open, right? We're playing tight playoff hockey for sure, but mm-hmm. things are still a little more free flow and a little more, you know, we're still getting a little more creative and taking some risks on offense. Yeah. And 
we end up with, you know, eight goals in game three. Dallas wins a wild one. And and then from then on, the Edmonton defense just kind of figured it out. Yeah, I mean, so the similarities, as we mentioned, so like you said, same result through three games, a 2-1 lead for the team that ultimately loses a series. Both series go the, go the same length in terms of games played. Yep. Both clinching games had the same final score. Yep. I mean, like a lot of similarities. Both uh, losing teams with excellent, excellent, probably better goaltenders in a vacuum. Yeah. Um, right. Just Eric and Ottinger, probably you, better than Skinner. And you almost fit, you almost took away all, like ninety percent of what I was going to say in terms of like bringing up the Edmonton defense and what they were able to do or whatnot. But I have one other caveat that's gonna that was really the turning point for me. Okay. Because he brought up everything through games three. You know, game three, Dallas has the two one lead in the series. You know, kind of got a wild game three, which was very much like what happened on the other side. And then to me, Dallas lost the series in game four. Yeah. They had a two nothing lead on the road five and a half minutes in. As And they looked the, good, too. Well, they did. So the, the, uh, the line I kept having run through my head as I watched this series was what's the de- kind of like what's the deal with one team not wanting to start on time because practically every game until the last one somebody didn't show up for the first period or at least had a, a, sit, a stretch where you were massively outplayed right and i just didn't get it and that's another example game 4 it was all dallas in the beginning they they had two goals before edmonton had a shot yep and you're looking at that going oh boy that's, you know, that's the Dallas Stars team that I had picked. Like, I picked that team to win the cup, and I'm looking at that, and I'm going, they like, are on a mission. They look so road. much better on the road. Oh. They're, they're setting this thing up great. And as soon as you let the, this, the thing about the Edmonton Oilers, as soon as you let that team feel it a little bit because of the types of players they have, they Connor will. Just goes, Zoom. And it didn't even have, in game four, the, that, that's maybe the best part and one of the biggest things that, to Edmonton's credit is yep. – it w- yes, it was a little because yes, he steps on the ice. He's a presence. So McDavid gets out there. Yes, you have to pay attention, but it's not him scoring the goals. And it wasn't dry and it wasn't Zach Hyman. It wasn't one of those guys who got the first goal to get the Oilers back on the board in that game. Ryan McLeod. Yep. Huge goal. Assisted by Corey Perry and Darnell nurse who two days earlier when the series, you know, was, when it went to two one Dallas in the series was getting put through the ringer for his defensive oh, play. They had the torches and pitchforks ready, right? And then and, and then then that g- general group of players helps you tie the game. And then you get to the second period. You're in a tie game. It's two two. You know Dallas has been good in the game at different points. Now Edmonton's been pushing a little bit, and Dallas gets a power play, and this turns the whole thing upside down because they get a shorthanded goal from Matthias Janmark. Yep. You know what, you know, look at the depth again. Like that's a big, that's a big deal. Yep. Well, and speaking of depth, um, Dallas does take a pretty massive hit losing Ropa hints for most of the series there in the beginning. Um, and then once he came back, it was kind of like what you, was even in. you really saw it in game four, five, six, like he, yeah, he was banged. Up I thought, sure. I thought, especially watching five and six, like, Four, you th- four, you think the adrenaline's gonna run, and then to be on, and to be honest, the way they started that game, even though we, like, even though he may not be having the biggest impact playing, it's like, well, the team's got a lift, so right. sure, who cares? He doesn't have to play his best if everybody else plays great. Yep. And, well, and, and it, Wyatt Johnson continued to look great. Yeah. Like there's there's definitely great things to look forward to with this Dallas team. Like you're going to lose a couple of your big guys, right? Like it looks like Joe Pavelski is going to leave. I don't know if they're going to be able to ref- uh, afford Chris Tanev, you know, things along those lines. Yeah. Like it's not going to be the same group, but that core in Dallas is really, really I, strong. I do feel, I do feel really bad for Joe Pavelski that it's, that you it's going to end like this. Like that looked like the team that was poised to do it. And instead, you know, and he decides that's it. Yeah. So Kevin, right. on Wednesday, June fifth, twenty twenty four, who's the greatest NHL player in history without a Stanley Cup? Oh wow! I mean, I feel like I need more time to think about that. Um, I mean, it, to me, it comes down to Dion or if if Pavelski gets there, because I think that's kind of the the standard answer, right? Like, yeah, 
Marcel Dion is kind of the answer, all things I'm, considered. I'm trying to look over at like my wall of Hall of Famers. Wall to, like, of figure out. Cup. Well, because most of these guys have won a <laughs> cup. Although, although there's one that may there's a good great player who may I don't think won a cup that would qualify. I think Pavel Bure never won a cup. Did he not? Well, Vancouver, a little bit with the Rangers when they when they obviously he weren't was, winning. Yeah, he wasn't on Florida, the Rangers team. Okay. But Florida. Like he played for Vancouver and Florida. Vancouver, both teams have never won a cup. I'm checking just to make sure he didn't go spend half a season somewhere in Ray Borkett. But um, I mean, if you're on, if you're going to go on the train of Marcel Dion, by the way, you could throw Luke Robitaille into that category too. Yeah, but I, I take. I think Dion's Dion higher. Robitaille. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Uh, let's see. I can't go to these. I can't go to the one part of the wall because that's too. I'm going back too far, and these guys all definitely won cups. Right. Okay, I am skimming Burry's like, career I'm just like to make sure he didn't go somewhere certain. else. Vancouver, Florida, New York, New York. Yeah, fair enough. Like, like Burry definitely falls into that category. Um, do you go with a? I mean, do you go with a guy like Matt Sundin? I think he's a solid candidate, but again, that's I think a solid I, think, I mean, I still have the. I mean, there, it's but. here's the funny thing. It's a. It would have been a totally different conversation if it didn't happen later in his career but because because it finally ultimately did but dominic hasek was in that category for a long time there so frankly given his age so was alexander ovechkin sure um well i think i, I think a guy's like that you could you could throw in i mean to, if you're going deep into the career for some guys yeah. tamu salani yeah. was like that uh the aforementioned ray bork well, sure. Uh, yeah, the the kind of classic example, and I, then the flyers. I don't version have to, I don't have to look. At, I don't have to look at the puck wall for that one. I have. To, I can just look at the pictures. The picture of Ray Bork with the cup. It's oh, is like oh, like okay. If you <laughs> if you're talking NHL calls, not hockey calls, NHL calls. Yeah, that's top. That's high for me. That might be top three in terms of the broadcast. Oh yeah. Oh, Raymond yeah, Bork. Gar- oh, come on, man. Yeah, Gary come Thorne. on. Yeah, we're uh, we could we could all use some more Gary Thorne in our lives. Imagine they pull Gary Thorne out for Game Seven. <laughs> that would be imagine. Insane. Imagine this series goes seven, and you just everything um, goes everything goes black. Spotlight comes up. Gary Thorne walks emerges out, out of the darkness. Um, <laughs> That is a great question, though. Great food for thought in terms of that. So now that Pavelski probably joins that group. Listen, we're into summer shows here. So let us know on Twitter at YWT Podcast. <laughs> let, Ke- let Kevin know at Kevin underscore Durso. Who's the best player to never win a cup? Uh, Pavelski, by the way, um, 201 career playoff games. Take a guess on goals. Two, okay, so you said 201 career playoff games? Yep. Okay, I'm... I'm I'm doing myself a favor here. I'm because I, I have hockey reference open, but I am not looking at numbers. I trust I am, you. I am. I was trying to pull up a list of like the top point guys in, in their careers to like yeah. look at the names and be able to tell who else on that list. I maybe was because I actually just thought of two more offhand. By the way, okay. as a result of this conversation, <laughs> um, no, no, because no, you'll you'll see what, what how I made the connection really quickly here. Um, so 201 playoff games. He probably had. I mean, you're you're spanning a very big section. A lot of San Jose Sharks. A lot of San Jose games and a lot of, you know, the recent runs with Dallas had a good chunk. Too. Oh, yeah. Some deep runs. It's It's got to be like 50. Higher. Higher. Yep. I'll give you one more guess on the one. 62. 74. Really? Wow. What a number. That, so, so come by the on, man. So by the way, he's, he's, the, more uh, the, he's more in the conversation than you think. So by the way, the con- the other connection, by the way, if we okay. want to have this conversation about players who never won a cup, right? Um, so Joe Pavelski will join his longtime teammates, I would imagine, because Joe Thornton's got to be on that list, and yep. so does Patrick Marlowe. Painful. I know. Yeah. There's a there's a few others. I mean, I'm as I'm looking, there's a few others that pop up that like immediately I recognize, and I'm like, yeah, I don't remember them winning a cup. You know, I will like, say that I will say though I think the second act with Dallas kind of puts Pavelski over Marlowe and uh, Thornton in my book. I know sure. Thornton. I know Thornton had the the first chapter with Boston sure. and stuff. You, you know, believe so. Believe so. Believe it or not, by the way. So 
I th- I think t- yeah, I'll say well sure, okay, because and yeah, to so- bring to bring it back to this series, by the way. Yeah. Somebody very quickly climbing the list of best NHL players to not have a cup is Connor McDavid. Well, sure. So I have two more that I knew I pulled off of the list pretty quickly yep. because they both have flyer ties. Any guesses? Okay. Uh, flyer ties. Okay. So. In in fact, Randy I will. Well, and so in fact, I will give you another hint that may help. Okay. They, the, the flyer tie comes at the end of their Hall of Fame careers. Okay, so Paul pretty Coffey close or close five. close in close in. Well, Paul Coffey won with all, all those. <laughs> Paul Coffey's <laughs> going for what at this point? What would he? Go? How many cups? He might be going. Team? He might be going one for the thumb. That that is, as I was gonna say, it's five, right? He, he won four in Edmonton before, and then he's gonna I, get his fit. Or, or no, I'm sorry, no, no, no. He won four three in Edmonton as a player, and then mm-hmm. won again with, I think, with Pittsburgh in '91. Okay, so this is one for the thumb. So for this him. would be one for the thumb for Paul Coffey. Good for Paul Coffey. Yes. It's, uh, yeah, by the way, yeah, by the not way, him. Yeah, but by the way, there that is a that is a storyline for this cup final, though. Oh yeah. Big time storyline for this cup final. But I mean, it's also just a historical franchise trying to win their first cup since Gretzky, right? Like, I mean, uh, well, no, technically since the first year after Gretzky, but you no, know since, what I mean. Well, no, so it, it's it, they'd be winning their first cup since the captain of the team is, you know, is the guy who's doing studio well, work and, now. And that's fair. <laughs> um, well, and speaking of the captain of the team, the current captain, Connor McDavid. Yeah, well, it, hold on, hold on. I didn't get the yeah, two yeah, yeah. players. Oh, yeah, go for it. No, um, I was trying to get the two players from you. End of, players. end of yeah, their no, go for it. Go for okay. it. Okay. So um obviously fun, you know, remembering fondly because he's since passed, but Dale Howard Chuck. Oh, uh, okay. And uh Adam Oates. Okay. I forgot Adam Oates spent some time. Adam Oates, by the way, I believe. Man. No, okay, that wasn't his last year. I thought his last year might have been he played for the Ducks the year they went to the final against the Devils and lost. Oh, he was, and that that- was- he was on that team. I forgot they got a whole bunch of old dudes for that team. <laughs> I think they signed like two or three, like just decrepit old dudes and gave them like six minutes a night. But you're pretty much, I mean, you're pretty much spot on. I mean, the, the guy who is, if I'm looking, if we're looking at the top of the points list, the guy, the first guy without a cup is Marcel Dion. So, yeah. And I think that's the clear answer, but I do think there's a real chance even with ridiculous eighties inflated scoring stats. I think there's a chance Connor McDavid ends up there. So if he doesn't get a cup, now also, or it is also pretty, ever. it is also pretty impressive to see the number of guys on this list that you can count that you go only have one like can you can you filter by active um i don't know if you can filter it it does highlight who's active okay. why are you looking for a guy who's I'm active just curious who the, who the top two or three active point getters are without cups <laughs> oh boy i just found the answer okay so let's see. Uh, I'm scrolling through the active players, and right away at the top of the points list among the actives, Crosby, Ovechkin. Okay, done, done. We just talked about they that. Have cups, right? uh, thir- third on the list is Malkin. So, yep, Cup. been there, done Check. that. Right um, ne- right behind Malkin is Patrick Kane. Also been there, done that. Um, Check, Check. Check. frankly. Fifth, fifth on the list is Andre Kopitar. Check Check that one Check. off. Check. Uh, sixth on the list among actives is Steven Stamkos. Check that one off. Check. And, Check. Then I found, and then I found Joe Pavelski. Okay, so Joe Pavelski comes off the list. Yep. Do you First. know? Do you know who is right behind Joe Pavelski in points that would then become this guy? Would that be Claude Giroux? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's Claude oh, Giroux. Oh, oh no. For oh, for what it's worth, the because okay, so they're. Because this doesn't, this one doesn't count. He checks the box too. Eric Stahl's next on the active list, although I don't know if he's actively really playing as much anymore. Yeah. The, ne- the next guy on the list, this is fascinating. Okay. The next active player behind Claude Giroux, who doesn't give me, have a give, cup. Give me, give me one quick shot at it. Go ahead. Uh, what conference? East. East. Metro? No. Okay. Um, is it Austin Matthews? Or right would it be John Tavares then? It's John Tavares. Okay, I, duh. Okay. The the cat the only the captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs yeah, yeah, who yeah. has to deal with you know with that yeah, exactly. That's funny. Uh, actually, you want to finish the segue off perfectly? Okay. If Pavelski's considered retired, which I guess I don't think it's official yet, so I right. guess technically he's active. 
and Claude Drew is next on the list, and then John Tavares is the next one. The next player down the list active who wouldn't have a cup is Connor McDavid. And he's way younger than the rest of those guys. That's hilarious. Okay. Um, You realize we're talking about Connor McDavid 1,000 points next season. Oh, I know. But he's also like six or seven years younger than the rest of the guys we're talking about. Um, It's just so funny how he's going to very quickly start climbing like NHL lists and the active lists are going to be irrelevant because they're all just going to be him. Yeah. Um, it's going to be there sooner rather than later. So uh, regardless, I it is going to be nice to see him in the Stanley Cup final. It will be nice to see a marquee matchup. Uh, the national exposure, ABC, ESPN, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Et cetera. So, so we have, have we, we actually, have we actually talked about the series? Well, we did um, a little, we about a little bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to get to, we want to get to the final. Preview. Yeah. Let's, let's get to the final here. So uh, it is the Florida Panthers against the Edmonton Oilers in the Stanley Cup final. And the Edmonton Oilers have home ice, right? This starts in Edmonton, right? Uh, no, it starts in Florida. Oh, this is in Florida. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Okay. So the Florida Panthers have home ice here. The first two games will be in sunrise. Game one is Saturday night. Uh, what do you think? Like, I, I mean, obviously we've watched these teams go through it all to get here. Uh, I think there's a real chance we have the two best teams, which is nice because that's not always the case. Um, we talk a lot about the NHL playoffs being a grind and a slog and a, a battle of attrition in a lot of ways. And yeah, we got the two best teams here come hell or high water. You know, you can make a case for Dallas, but we got pretty darn close. So I was never that high on Edmonton. I like, I don't, I didn't sit there and consider them a non contender at all. Like I, right. I, let's be real from the very beginning. I had them in the conference final. I'm sure like, I kind of can't turn that into, well, gee, I can't see you making a cup final. You know, like there were others that I, I, I think among the group, like I think I probably had Dal. I think I probably had Dallas, Dallas, Colorado, and Edmonton were probably my top three to be the West, like the West representative in this. And probably my top three on the other side were Rangers, Hurricanes, Panthers. Okay. And, and that was about as like, like I kind of left myself with room to swap out somebody in case something didn't go the way I expected it to, to get to the conference final you know, or whatever. Um, the storylines in this are phenomenal. Oh, you yeah. have, you have either Canada's cup drought could be over after 31 years. Edmonton last went to a cup final in 2006. They last won in 1990. Florida has never won a cup. It's McDavid's yep. first cup final. There's plenty of reasons to watch right there. Uh, like Paul right Maurice, off. Paul Maurice has 4,000 games coached. Uh, Chris Knobloch has 70. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Um, Crazy. So, so, and I, like, I feel like you want me to jump into the, yeah. Um, like yeah. The, let's dive into the analysis. Into the prediction, yeah. Well, or no, I mean the prediction oh, part, yeah. I'm gonna, I don't need to, do, to reveal just yet. Okay. Um, but I have like one of the things I've seen like effective immediately is like everybody jumped to not only Panthers to win, but like Panthers to do this quickly, kind of in a way. Okay. I've okay. seen a lot of I've seen a lot of people who looked immediately and went, Well, Florida's just gonna have a field day here or something like that. You know well, what I mean? And I guess I'll spoil this part of it. I won't say everything just yet, but I am picking the Panthers to win because right. for, for this reason alone. Honestly, I always had them in this position to be in the final. I didn't okay. pick them to win the cup, but I had them going. And if my pick to win the cup is not going to be there, then I'm going to go to the other side and say, okay, you are there. Your logic got you there. I will follow. Sense. I will follow right. through on that. I am absolutely not discounting the possibility that Connor McDavid just wins this thing straight up by himself. He's going to come out with just pure white hair and just go absolutely super saiyan. This he's that good. Series. Yep. And with a little bit more of a supporting cast right now, you think about how beyond dry cycle, they're actually getting a Zach lot Hyman. More you have Hyman. Kane contributing. You have Evan Bouchard on the back end. You have Ryan Nugent Hopkins playing really well. There's the third one. I was going to yeah. say, I had Nugent Hopkins, Hyman, Bouchard. Um, I, I, you don't get hard hitting analysis quite like this anywhere else. Don't take penalties. Wow. 
Yeah, I know. Uh, the, is it because their penalty? Is it because their power play is like forty four percent or whatever I, it I, is? Well, those right, like, right. Don't take penalties. Their power play is going to get you at some it's point. Stupid. Um. Now this well, is now this it's is, the Stanley Cup Finals. There won't be penalties. We'll see. Um. Sometimes they may have no choice but to call something if Connor McDavid is like slashed dude, in the face and bleeding. Well, just no, just like, doing, just putting a move on that nobody can stop unless you absolutely take him out. That's fair. And. Yeah, and you really have no choice. Everybody in the world will be able to see it's a penalty. Um, we'll see. <laughs> I, the one thing I will give them, honestly, their penalty kill has been outstanding. Their penalty yeah. kill has been really, really good. And, well, if they can, and then if they continue to get the goaltending, which to me was their biggest weakness. I mean, we're talking about a guy in Stuart Skinner who the previous series was literally being questioned for his ability to carry them through a series. Well, and he, he was on the bench. I was just saying he lost his job. You took you turned to Cal Pickard in the playoffs in the in the middle of the playoffs with in a, prime in a, Connor McDavid in a series that you were trailing two to one to yep. get it back even. And then when he lost game five, you had to go back to the other guy and say, win both with Connor McDavid in his prime and 14 months away from being a UFA. And you're going to pull this nonsense. OK, <laughs> right. So anyway, but all that stuff like it, there is a tough team to pick against because there's elements where we've we've done this over the years with Vegas didn't really. I mean, if the, the closest guy Vegas had was Eichel in terms of okay. like, here's the guy, the that you're, guy, right? Well, well, like the guy that you're going to put the most focus on in terms of it's finally going to happen for him. The year before that, we did it with McKinnon and it was look at how long McKinnon's been around with McKinnon's this. McKinnon's going to get his cup. And, yep. and and as much as you could do it with Landeskog, too, well, because he was playing in the whole playoff, too, McKinnon was the star, and we knew Absolutely. he was the star. And then, the well, the year before was a repeat winner, but the in 2020, when it was Tampa, it, it was Stamkos and Kucherov Stamco. getting there first, right? But it, but, well, it, but it was primarily Stamkos, yeah. Because it was like, he's been around even longer, and it's going to finally happen. It's going to finally be his time. And I feel like people have been waiting for this moment, and I hope McDavid has, for that matter. Like, like McDavid kind of comes across sometimes, like when they talk to him, like nothing really phases him sometimes or whatever. He's kinda very, like, he's been like a guy who trained a, since he was 12. Right. And kind of like a guy who doesn't have much of a pulse because, like, how can you sometimes? Oh, well, and like I said, I think he's been media trained since he was 12. Well, sure. And I think that's probably most. Oh, of I, it. I, I, we've seen it time and time again. My point is, in, in bringing that up, is uh, like I highly doubt he doesn't recognize the magnitude of what's about to happen. And, it may just be his time. I mean, you could, you could, you could also make that argument for like three guys on the other side, right? You know, truthfully, like I, I feel like people would say that about Matthew Kachuk. I feel like people would say that about Barkov. I feel like people would say that about a guy. This is not even the star, like one of the top guys per se, but I feel like people would say that about Aaron Ekblad. Yeah, like, hey, you've been around for the long haul. You were a first overall pick by well, by a team that was terrible ten years ago, and it's your turn. It's going to be your time. And that yeah. leads me. And that leads me to a fun little question here. Before your prediction, okay, I want the first three cup passes for each team. Oh, for each team. So, um, where do you want to start? Which team? You tell me which one you want to start with. Yeah. I, 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 do I at least get the courtesy of looking at the roster? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. This isn't like that kind of guessing game. All right, I open Florida. Okay, that's fine. Florida Panthers. Um, Gary Bettman's there. He presents the cup to Alexander Barkov. Alexander Barkov raises. He skates it around. He probably yells something in Russian. He <laughs> goes. He goes to hand it off to a teammate. Kevin, who's the first pass? Aaron Ekblad. Okay, I think that's the correct decision. I'm. I'm a little surprised he's not the captain of that team, just given how long he's been there. I understand what Barkov is, though. I don't. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> But it's almost like a Tavares Matthews situation where, yeah. You know, um, but I do think that he is very likely right there. Um, okay, so so Aaron Ekblad gets the cup. He raises it up in the air. He skates around. He takes a little bit of a lap. Mm -hmm. Who does he pass it off to? Does he pass it off to another member from the same draft? <sighs> That would be interesting. I'm gonna go another little, member of the same top four. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit out of left field on you here. Okay. He passes the cup to Kyle Oposo. See, I th I think Kyle Oposo is your third pass. 
I think you give it to one more like true blue dyed in the wool Florida Panther first. I mean, if that makes want, sense. I mean, you want my other option then? Yeah, go. For, well, for, who would be your third pass then? Who does Hog Post? Like, pass he passes it, it to Sergey Bobrovsky. I think that makes a lot of sense. I I would probably have something pretty similar. I might flip the order of of those last two there, but uh, yeah, I I think that makes a lot of sense for them. Um, Ekblad is a pretty high. He's a good um, old guy without a cup contender, right? Right. Like, I mean, there's he's there's not a, there yet. He's not. There's old, a couple but, others like that you could go with that are in, the, in that older guy doesn't have a cup kind of material. Like, and Flor and Aaron Ekblad got here when it was bad. Yes. Like he was in Florida when it was bad. He was the first piece that kind of started digging them out of it. Right. So by your he logic, saw the ugly of it. Right. So by that's what I'm saying. By your logic, you want to turn it to, uh, although see, this is, it's kind of hard though, because you look at some of these other guys and it's like, they haven't been there for that long. It wasn't that long right. ago. They went out and got Sam Reinhardt. It wasn't that long ago. They got Matthew Kachuk. Like, it was Sam it was, Bennett. It wasn't that like, long ago. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago. Really? They, they brought on Carter Verhage. Right. Like, no, a lot of those guys haven't been there that long. Um, but I think like Barkov getting it first. Uh, like I know he's the captain, but Barkov would have been one of the guys that would be passed to course. if he wasn't because that's why he's wearing the C. Right. It just <laughs> I mean, he's not one of the oldest guys, but do you do you do something for Brandon Montour because he's been around for a while? It feels Maybe. like he's been on there for a little bit more. I feel um, like it's a it's a it's a fine line to walk because it's not sure. just how long you've been there. It's also like how much you contributed to the team. It's it is how much you contributed to the team. I think there's also an but there is also an element like because I hear you with the poso, you know, like I hear exactly right. where you're coming from with it. But I also think about you know it, it, it kind of brings the chemo team in one into equation too. Like team and didn't play near as much, but they knew what it was going to mean to him at that. That's stage a little life. different. Right. It is a little different, but they knew what it was going to mean to him at that stage of his life. And Oposo has been through a bunch too. Well, then I think Oposo either gets it first or third in this situation. Probably. Like, it, I, I could see a world where you turn and immediately give it, you know, you, even the, the Jonathan Taves, like come get right. it chemo. Like well, but something that, like that. That's also why I go with Ekblad. Fair like, enough. That's why I go with Ekblad. I, because, and, Cause Ekblad has been an, he's for, you know, completely a Panther, never played anywhere else. And then you think about the, you know, that, the broken, that was also the, the broken, that Chicago team's third cup in five years. Like they all had their cups already. I know that's true. <laughs> but like, like that's what I'm saying. Like, like Ekblad's got both been around for the longest time with that team to go through all of the bad to get to the good. all of the bad and then his own personal bad of thinking about some of the debilitating injuries that he had and like Homie not being able to like, it right so like that's natural you hand it to him he gets yeah. it first absolutely freaking lutely every time and then okay. I, that's when i start to get to a little bit all right take so a look to see who was the general manager who signed iron act to his elc Twenty fourteen. I'll give you the year. Yeah, well, I know who. I know what year he got drafted. So that's right. not the hard part. I'm trying to remember who the hell the general manager of the Florida Panthers would have been in twenty fourteen. Wasn't Talon yet? Was it? It was Dale Talon. Was it really? Okay, yep. I'll take that. Good call. Good call. Um, yeah. So that tells you how long Aaron Eckblad's been around. He has seen some of the worst days in the Florida Panthers franchise history. He has seen some empty seats. Let me tell you that much. Holy. <laughs> um. So he, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Let's go to the other team now. Uh, Gary Bettman's out there. He is the happiest he's ever been because he is handing the cup <laughs> to Connor McDavid. Yes. Maybe in Canada, if he plays his cards right, or, you know, if, if things fall the right way, if things go the right way. And if it's in Canada, by the way, Edmonton is going to be on fire. Like y'all thought Vancouver was bad. Holy Edmonton, if they win, is gonna be crazy. Um so Connor McDavid gets the cup. Yeah. He takes hopefully a four-minute victory lap because that man <laughs> has earned it. Yeah. When he is finally when his arms are sore and he is finally ready to pass the cup on, there's an easy answer. Well, you're going to say Leon. I think that's the correct answer because you have Batman and Robin. All right. I wouldn't be surprised. The only other one that I can think of that kind of qualifies is both like where you're going for, towards with the core yeah. 
would be to go with Nugent Hopkins, who's been around for a little longer. I think Nugent is your second pass. I think that's where Drysdale goes. That's fair. Um, because here's the thing: one of my first, my, my first instinct is always to is kind of always to go towards a guy who may be calling it quits or is close to the end of his career. Yeah, are you gonna say what I think you're gonna say? In, like, yeah. Well, I'm not because I'm not picking this because the the first one that would come to mind is Corey Perry, but he's already won one, so I don't know if they would go as crazy about that. These guys, all of these guys, would have never won one. Like a bunch of them wouldn't have. Hey everybody, Kevin here from the YWT podcast. Unfortunately, we had to cut this week's show a little short due to some technical difficulties. So I am here to provide the finale of our show, our predictions for the Stanley Cup final, both myself and on behalf of Kyle. Kyle has the Edmonton Oilers winning in six games. He added in the detail that he thinks is going to end in overtime, by the way. Uh, and, and he picks Connor McDavid to win the Con Smythe. I'm going to stick with the pick that I had. Uh, the Florida Panthers in seven games. I have Alexander Barkov winning the Con Smythe. And that's going to pretty much do it for this week's show. We will be back with an, another show sometime after the Stanley Cup final. Perhaps on the earlier end if it ends earlier than expected. If it were to go closer to the distance, we'd have a show hot on the heels of both the Stanley Cup final ending and the start of all the offseason activity, the NHL draft and free agency. Be sure to follow along with the podcast. You can listen to the podcast anywhere you get your podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, SportsTalkPhilly.com. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. And you can watch the show over there. That's going to wrap things up. So until next time, we'll see you.